Hello and welcome to episode 91 of On Liberty, coming to you live from the Center for Independent Studies in Fort Worth, Texas. <laughs> That's right, I'm coming to you from Texas. And joining me today, I hope, is Dei Wu, president of the New South Wales Young Liberals. We seem to be having some technical problems. I'm not sure if I'm off the air. There we go. <laughs> Dei, good to see you. Um, so thanks for joining us today. It's really a thrill to have you on the show. And of course, we'd like to start with kind of what happened last week from a young liberal's perspective. I think from a young person's perspective, we, well, from a young liberal perspective, we didn't see a, a party that offered enough policies that were based in liberal values. So a lot of my members throughout, you know, the, the past budget, even with the $250 handout, those policies are fundamentally not liberal policies. And it disillusioned, it alienated our own people, our own members um, who perhaps didn't want to come out and campaign, but also it alienated, you know, traditionally liberal voters because we are the ones that are meant to be good at economic management and that's what we're voted in for. Uh, but if we are trying to outcompete with Labor in terms of spending, in terms of how, you know, how much money we can we can throw at a problem, we can't win Labor on, we can't uh, compete with Labor on that. So I think we've moved away from liberal values and that's what we have to get back to. Now, I'm very interested to hear you say that perhaps some young liberals weren't as motivated to campaign as they might have been in the past. I, I mean, I assume you were out there campaigning and your close colleagues, but what were people telling you? I mean, did you really have trouble getting out, getting out the volunteers? Yeah, I mean, it was, for for me, I was at Reid on election day. Um, I was campaigning for Fiona Martin and I had to bring in my family and friends because the Young Liberal Movement, yes, we, we are the, you know, the grassroots of the party, but we had people spread very thinly across multiple electorates, across multiple marginal seats, across multiple, uh, you know, seats that we wanted to win as well. So the Young Liberals definitely played their part, but... You know, we lost certain female members who perhaps didn't want to campaign for a specific person. Uh, we lost traditional liberal voters who couldn't bring themselves to hand out a how to vote on election day. Now, one explanation for that is the initial explanation you gave in your intro, which was that you know, people weren't as motivated because they didn't feel the Liberal Party was really standing up for liberal values. But another potential explanation is that maybe many of the young liberals were out campaigning for Teals. And I'm curious, what do you think about that? I mean, you're much closer to the kind of have your finger on the heartbeat of all of this. Which way was it? I think the Teals were more, uh, they weren't young people supporting the Teals. They were traditionally liberal voters um, in certain pockets of Sydney and predominantly female liberal voters who would have normally perhaps maybe they didn't hand out for the party but they would have voted for the party but they felt energized this time and you know one of the major policy platforms of the teal campaigns was uh, integrity on implementing a anti-corruption body and in 2019 the coalition did pledge before the election that they would implement it and when you say you're going to do something and you don't do it especially on an issue like corruption and integrity it just looks really, really bad. And it looks like you're hiding something, even if you're not. Um, so I think because we couldn't deliver, that gave the independents a campaign to platform on and even Labor gained traction on it, on it. But that issue would never have gotten airtime if we had just implemented a sensible ICAC model. I, I'm interested to hear you say that because my, my very favorite US politician right now is Representative Jim Jordan of Ohio. And he has a new book out that's simply titled do what you said you would do. Yeah. <laughs> and his whole, yeah. his whole mantra for getting elected is keep your promises. Um, do, you, do you really feel that, I mean, were liberals, were the, was the last liberal administration not keeping promises because it didn't stand by them or because, let's face it, there was a public health emergency and everything just got shunted aside for the coronavirus? I mean, the... Pandemic, yes, we have to acknowledge that it was unprecedented and, you know, the government's support packages did support a lot of people, a lot of businesses throughout that period. But I think, 
if you look at the last budget, for example, that $250 handout, most people who would have received it, it doesn't make much impact on them. Uh, they're not, you're not going to swing a vote and you've just cost the budget even more money, which our generation has to pay off. So from a young person's perspective, it was a lose, lose, lose situation. Really? And so uh, there wasn't a sense that, you know, the, the rescue packages that came out, JobKeeper, you know, kept, I mean, let's face it, JobKeeper kept young people's salaries uh, but young jo job keeper and job seeker represented a higher proportion of young people's pre-pandemic salaries than older people because your earlier stages of your career wouldn't that have been popular among young liberals i mean job keeper i i accept was needed at the time um it was a lot of money like we do have to acknowledge that but i'm more talking about the 250 dollars that the government handed out in the most recent budget or they proposed to ha or they did hand out actually Right, right. And I'm also very curious to hear you say that um, that young people weren't particularly campaigning for the Teals. Now, that, that does reflect what I've seen literally just in my neighborhood. I Today I'm in Fort Worth, but normally I'm in Darlinghurst and I you know, go to Paddington a lot. And I saw a lot of the campaign workers were mainly my age and older uh, for the Teal campaigns, the people I saw on the streets handing out flyers at least. But we're always hearing that climate change is the youth issue. And of course, the, you know, the overwhelming kind of teal message was, you know, we're all in on carbon reduction. Uh, do you not think that would have inspired young voters? In terms of the teals inspiring young voters? Yeah, I, I'm curious. So I'm really curious about why young liberals are, are not out there and enthusiastic or weren't out there and enthusiastic in this election cycle compared to previous ones. And I'm just going on these kind of accounts I hear in the press. I'm not Australian. I don't vote in Australia. But we're always hearing endlessly that you know, young people are worried about climate change. So why was it mostly middle aged and older people campaigning Teal? Why didn't they get a wave of young liberals coming to join their campaigns? I think from my perspective as a young person, I still believe in the major structure of the two party system. You create stability with the two party system. I think with the TEALs, you disproportionately award certain electorates greater, you know, power, especially on the crossbench in that two party system. So a lot, of, a lot of young liberals, whilst they were discontent with perhaps the government's position on, uh, you know, not reducing emissions fast enough, we still see the value in staying within the party and affecting change that way rather than going independent. Um, and that's certainly the case for me. I, I see the value in staying the course. And especially now, as we you know, have a bloodbath in the past two weeks, hopefully that shows the senior party, because at a young liberal level, we recognise that we need to do more and we and not just do more, but we need a concrete plan. You need to plan out how exactly you're going to decarbonize not just wave around a um you know a target to aim for so i think from a young person's perspective we have been talking about this and we have been championing it for my term the previous president's term but it's just now up to the senior party to recognize that we can't do business as usual because we will be unelectable everybody has moved on the ship has sailed on whether we should be even debating climate change and we just need to get on with the job of it as a major political party. And we, we can't. And often the argument that people who don't believe in climate change or don't think that we should do much on it say, but what about China? Well, I don't see, you know, saying, but they did it first is a legitimate policy platform of a developed nation like ourselves. Uh, we pay, you know, the we can every individual can argue. I don't need to pay tax because it doesn't make much difference and it's minuscule in the grand scheme of things. If we all did that, um, there would be no money for government services, no money for defence, no money for law and order and, and all the you know services that we, uh, we have the luxury to have in Australia. So I think it's the matter of it's the small contributions that everyone needs to get on board with and we can't continue ha to have the discussion that climate change isn't real. Okay. Now, 
I, I don't want to make this the carbon show, but we are a live yeah. show. We do take viewer questions. Uh, and I have two viewer, well, one viewer comment, one viewer question, both from two different Anthonys. <laughs> so we'll take from Anthony with a TH first, uh, refreshing you here from the president of the Young Liberals, rather than from middle-aged and older representatives from like, uh, like Salvatore. Uh, he didn't say like Salvatore, but I know that's what he meant. Uh, but then we have Anthony with a T uh, asking, do the Young Liberals actually believe that there is a climate crisis? Crisis, the thing is, because of where we sit, we sit as a youth wing of a political party that is just in a coalition that is just coming to terms with, we now have a plan to get to net zero by 2050. So I am cautious of any hysteric language that we use. I think we just have to go back to the economics of if we don't do it, we lose foreign investment. There will be foreign companies that completely avoid Australia because we are not playing our role in the broader picture. And also we lose out on industries that could potentially be innovating, for example, hydrogen, which is what the New South Wales government is looking at. If we can become a hydrogen superpower and we choose not to, um, and we sit on our hands, another country will. And if you just look at it from a economic foreign investment perspective, it's pretty obvious what our choices are. You just can't not do anything. And But I also don't think it's very helpful to use words like crisis, emergency, because it just alienates people. So we have to you know, sit on a very tight rope, a fine tight rope of how do we bring our people on board internally, but also continue to push for change externally. All right. Now, let me shift to the pressing emerging crisis, which seems to be an inflation crisis. Uh, now, prices are rising very rapidly, not just in Australia, but around the developed world. And I'm curious how concerned young liberals are about inflation and about prices in light of the fact that you know young people often don't have much savings. So inflation may not be a big concern for young people. Well, uh, I guess it's what you define young. Um, so are we talking under 40? Are we talking under 30? Yeah. For the young liberals, you know, our age base is between 30 to uh, 16 to 30. So okay. towards the end of it, some of them may have been able to get onto the property market. They may, they're likely living on their own or in a share house. They still have to buy groceries, pay electricity bills. Um, but if you look at the teals, a lot of them are in the 30 to 40 uh, late 40s, mid 40s range, and they're a much younger cohort, and that's the people that have been elected. So, whilst you know, in our opinion, young people is young people like 20 year olds. Um, right. There's a lot of 30 to 40 year olds who want, you know, inflation addressed. They want, uh, they're concerned about rising interest rates, and that's young families usually in that age range. Right. How, how big an issue is housing? Does that loom large for people in the 20s age range? Very much so. And, you know, the Young Liberals did a submission on abolishing stamp duty and moving to uh, a land tax that the New South Wales government was looking at. That's since been shelved um, because I think it's politically not viable at this point in time. But that's something that you were, you were, you were, to be clear, you were in favor of abolishing stamp duty. Is that correct? Correct, yes. Oh. And because young people, they're likely to buy apartments for their first property. And a land tax system would be much more accessible to buy your first home rather than a stamp duty. So for a $500,000 property, which you can barely get in Sydney, you're looking at about 18,000. So that's about, you know, 5% of the property value, um, which is significant. You have you have to save for another two, three years. And by that time, the property has already gone up. So I think if, but the thing is, the state government said this federal government needs to come on board to cover up that shortfall in funding that they will lose in the interim period. But from our perspective, we just want it abolished and um, for our parliamentarians to get on with the job because they looked at it, they consulted on it, and now it's just been shelved and we don't know when it's going to be implemented. All right, so we've talked about housing, inflation, uh, carbon and climate change. What else is on the Young Liberal agenda? We, uh, well, we are also looking 
in terms of the liberal values, so the young liberals, we are more ideological in some ways um, than the party. And we would like the party, when they are implementing policies, to be going back to those small government, fiscal responsibility, paying back debt, because ultimately that debt will you know, fall in our lap and our children's lap in the future. So that fiscal responsibility, we would like the government to be focused on, whether it's Labor, whether it's Liberal. And do you think that kind of back to basics would be a winner for, first of all, would it be a winner for liberals among young voters? I mean, young liberals are not the same as young voters as a whole. So would, be, would, it, would it be a win for liberals among young voters? And more broadly, would it be a win for liberals? I think so, because, you know, you ask young people, they've got, you know, very large hex debts. They've got uh, very high entry points into housing. Their wages are low, you know, they've got to start on internships in order to get a job and usually graduate jobs are around 60k, you know, for, for an average one. So they're already concerned with how much money they need to make. They shouldn't need to be concerned with how much money the government is spending, you know, as we pay more tax. So the government has a role to make sure that they are reducing, you know, the Ensuring the services is still there, but reducing the debt because at the end of the day, we're the ones that has to pay it. Yeah. Mm. We're, we're talking to Dei Wu, the president of the New South Wales Young Liberals. Dei, I'd like to turn to this emerging, I won't say a split in the Liberal Party, but this emerging, well, maybe I will say a split, a division, let's say, in the Liberal Party with Peter Dutton becoming leader of the opposition. I've heard a lot of talk in the press about the Liberal Party becoming more of a conservative party, more like the British Tories, the US Republicans, other people, other columnists pushing back and saying, no, that what's unique about Australia's Liberal Party is that it's a coalition between conservatives and classical liberals, and that should be that should remain its distinctive identity. How would you come down on that debate? I think the debate is slightly warped in that people within our party are now arguing, should we go more right? Should we go more left? What base should we try and capture? I honestly think that our base is all Australians. If we just genuinely address the issues that affect the majority of Australians without targeting a specific subset of the demographic of Australia, if you genuinely address people's problems, they will vote for you. The votes will come. Um, they don't want issues like housing affordability, paying back debt, tax reform to be politicised. These issues that have some, or even climate change, these issues have been characterised as left and right issues, but the issue itself is neutral. It's how you implement it that's, you know, either through left-leaning policies or right-leaning policies, like do you raise a tax or do you do it through incentivising private enterprise? I, and that's a very you know, Menzian <laughs> position. I know Robert Menzies is very popular among some of our viewers, and uh, he's, of course, you know, the founder of the modern Liberal Party. But there is another group who's really looking for a political party, any political party in Australia, to address cultural issues that are not... You know, I don't hear you talking about... Like, when, when people talk about pragmatic policy that makes people's lives better, I'm often reminded of Scott Morrison saying that, well, you know, abolishing the, you know, Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act, that won't create a single job. I mean, well, well, no, it won't it actually put a couple people out of a job, <laughs> you know, the race, race commissioners maybe. But um, don't people also care about these, you know, very difficult cultural issues, even if they're not bread and butter issues? I personally don't think most Australians are voting based on the cultural issues or the cultural wars. I think that is probably falls very far down the list when you have inflation at 5%, when you've got rising interest rates, national labour shortage, rising food and fuel prices. So it might be an issue that can be addressed when we have the luxury to, but I don't think it should, should have been, for example, a policy platform uh, for the last election for example, in Warringah with Catherine Deves, I don't think that we should be using certain anti-transgender sentiment as a campaign platform, as a matter of principle, first of all. It's divisive. And if you want to have that conversation, 
do it outside an election campaign through the right channels with the right people with the proper process um but i i, I come back down to i personally don't vote on the culture wars even if i am right leaning i care about who will improve my quality of life how can i afford a property how can i increase my wages how can i ensure that you know petrol is under two dollars a liter and that's e10 so that's what I'm thinking about. That's what most families are thinking about, these kitchen table issues. And that's what we have to get back to, not the cultural wars. And it is very pragmatic, but I just would like to you know, push you a little bit on this because if nobody, if no party, if, no, none, if neither of the major parties in Australia is willing to talk culture, that in effect seeds these, seeds the culture war issues to labor uh, it, or even to the, you know, to the Greens, to, uh, to groups that really have been pushing an agenda of significant cultural change in Australia. Now, that may be the right thing to do. Again, I emphasize I'm not Australian. I don't have a position on this, but I do feel that there, are, there seems to be a, a, a lot of anger, a lot of resentment, a lot of feeling among at least people I talk to in the Australian electorate that their views just aren't being represented. And if what the Liberal Party stands for is, you know, jobs, low inflation, you know, clean government, well, doesn't every party stand for jobs, low inflation and clean government? Probably, yes, because you've only got two major parties, uh, but it's how you do it, like I was saying before. It's how, you know, how you get to that outcome that is either left or right. And I think because we've been straying towards labor policies where we hand out money and we don't consider the bottom line and we don't consider conservative principles when we are implementing changes that's that's the point of difference um the people i talk to especially swing voters they honestly don't they're not worried about the cultural wars i can guarantee you that um they just want to be left alone by the government they want the government to do their core job to deliver essential services and to give them a better quality of life, whether that's through you know, tax reform, lowering taxes for them so that they've got more money to spend, whether that's addressing wage stagnation, uh, labour shortages that we're facing. So I, I would disagree with you on there may be sentiment on, you know, we're not ceding to labour that or, or greens that the culture wars should be addressed by another political party. But I think in the broader scheme of things right now where we are, it's not our first priority and we need to get back to our basics of economics. Okay. Now, Anthony, again, like I said, we do take questions from the audience and Anthony asks, this is part of several questions, but, but at, at the heart of one of his questions is, is about uh, separate Aboriginal representation uh, done through a constitutional mechanism that would create an Aboriginal voice to Parliament, um, do young Liberals have a either an official stance or even a consensus stance that you think you know lowercase young Liberals have any particular viewpoint on the Aboriginal voice? We haven't had a debate on it yet, so we don't have an official position. But I'm sure we will at our next Young Liberal Council. Um, I personally am quite cautious. Uh, that's where my conservative principles come in. You know, just looking at the recent election, you had we now have 10 members of parliament who have indigenous heritage and i think that is testament to the fact that if you want to represent australia through the parliamentary system do it in the house of reps do it through the senate do it in our existing system i don't think uh, that we should be elevating a certain group above others unless you are doing it for example a limited time to for symbolic reasons or you know we've got to make sure that if, if it is done it is done in a very limited manner and for a specific reason and not just symbolism and also we can't make we, we've got to make sure that that body doesn't have they may not have official veto power over certain policies for example but there might be political pressure to adhere to what they say so we've got to make sure that it doesn't become a third you know third arm of government. Um, so I'm I'm open to the debate and I'm open to seeing exactly what it is, but I don't think that the people who are putting forward, putting it forward, have actually got a concrete plan of 
what it will consist of and who will be voting, um, who's allowed to participate as a candidate, for example, how long it will go for. So there's so many questions. So I'd like to see a bit more of the policy details before we decide. And we'll have that debate internally and we'll probably present it once it's done. But isn't this just an example of, you know, I mean, process issues like constitutional reform are not those bread and butter kitchen table issues that you probably rightly believe that elections will be won or lost on. But if the Liberal Party doesn't take a strong stance, let's face it. I, trust me, there will that. be there will be a strong stance within the Liberal Party and there will probably be deferring stances. Um, but the reason we're talking about it now is because Labour have said that that's one of the first things that they will do. So we've, as we head towards that national debate, we've got to start thinking about it. We can't shy away from it and we've got to put forward our points on it. All right, well, we're going to have to start wrapping up. I just want to ask one last question, which is what is your top policy priority, not you personally, but you, you as the president of the Young Liberals in New South Wales, what's your top policy priority post pandemic? Other than what we've already discussed, which is housing affordability, probably be childcare. Um, a lot of our, you know, young liberals eventually will probably be having families and dealing with the cost of childcare. Um, we so the UNSW they actually put forward a proposal in 2019, which is you can either choose your current rebate arrangement or you receive a tax deduction of childcare expenditures of up to 60K per year per family. And that basically recognizes childcare as a work-related uh, deduction. You know, if we can do it for motor vehicles, if you're putting your child into childcare because you need to work, it is a work-related tax deduction. Uh, and that would increase the labor force partic participation amongst women. Uh, it would reduce the gender cap gender gap because women have to take more time out for parental responsibilities and it would boost productivity. So looking at childcare from an economic incentive point of view, from a productivity incentive, if we start with that, you know, women will see the value out of our policies and hopefully come back to our party rather than tills. Mm. Wu, thank you very much for joining us today on On Liberty. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks also to our producer, Nico Malian. The director of the Center for Independent Studies is Tom Switzer. I'm Salvatore Bonus. Thank you for watching On Liberty.